Okay, so we're continuing our discussion about foreign policy and the media and how all these things sort of intersect to affect foreign policy. And I want to talk about this phenomenon that folks may have heard of before called the CNN effect and kind of put it into a little bit of a historical context of, of where it sort of came from and then also talk about um, whether or not this is a real phenomenon. Um, and so I'll sort of begin with this as sort of part of a larger discussion on how the media can affect um, public attention, how it can frame events in a certain light, how it can potentially drive public opinion um, in an aggressive direction, and that can actually force the hand of politicians. And so one example that you might point to if you were you know, talking about sort of the media having um, outsized power in the foreign policy process might be the Spanish-American War, where um, the papers of William Randolph Hearst very much wanted a conflict with Spain over Cuba and sort of published sort of salacious and in some cases outright fake um, stories about um, the sort of Cuban struggle for independence um, and when the um, United States um, initially sort of tepidly puts its foot in um, and there's a fire aboard the main sort of Hearst paper sort of blow this up into uh, a, a terrorist attack or an act of war and suddenly the United States is fighting a war with Spain over Cuban independence um, in large part because of the political environment that was created by the papers of William Randolph Hearst. Um, today, when we talk about sort of the media creating a political environment that essentially forces the hand of politicians, we're talking about the CNN effect. Um, and this is um, based on um, or it gets linked to a story about George Bush Sr., who after his defeat in the 1992 presidential election is sort of sitting in the White House in December of 1992, um, watching these images of starving children in Somalia and warlords holding food hostage as part of the um, civil war and the collapsing UN um, intervention into Somalia and feeling like somebody ought to do something to respond to these horrible things that are happening in Somalia. And George Bush Sr. has this revelation that he is someone and therefore the United States intervenes in the Somali civil war to try to um, head off a humanitarian disaster. And the idea is that these emotional images that are being sort of broadcast into our homes um, through this new sort of global technology that's operating sort of 24 hours a day, cable news um, is going to dramatically change how people engage with um, horrible and atro atrocious things happening around the world, um, leading to greater humanitarian intervention. And so this is the, the kernel of the CNN effect um, in, in as it's been put forward. Um, I think that that's maybe a little unclear if this actually works in, pro in practice. And so um, I'll maybe point to um, the 1994 genocide as a useful, and, and the follow-up to that is a useful case study of this, um, that in 1994, um, shortly after um, the United States uh, has a Black Hawk helicopter shot down in Somalia um, and service men are drugged through the streets and that's broadcast on CNN. Um, a genocide breaks out in Rwanda, um, actually the month that the United States leaves Somalia. And over the course of about 100 days, something like 700,000 people are, are murdered um, as part of this genocidal campaign. Um, at the time, there was essentially zero media coverage at all about what was happening in Rwanda, um, so that it was really not even recognized as a genocide until shockingly late in in the, the um in the process and so if i was sort of making a cnn effect argument i might say wow well it's the absence of um global media coverage that resulted in global policymakers essentially dragging their feet on any sort of intervention in in rwanda in fact um the international community uh the Clinton administration in particular um, actively said, yeah, we suspect that maybe things are really bad in Rwanda and maybe even acts of genocide are happening, but uh, we're not gonna get involved. Um, and so from that, the international NGO community, folks who are, who are interested in, in human rights and, and genocide prevention, um, took away from that, that the failed response uh, 
to the Rwandan genocide was really an informational response, a failed informational response, that the CNN effect wasn't effectively mobilized to push an intervention and that there needs to be better systems in place to be able to document atrocities um, so that um, when things start going wrong, when genocide starts to occur or ethnic cleansing starts to occur, that it's sort of, you know, front and center that people are being bombarded with these sort of images of horrible things happening. Um, and that was sort of the, the template that was brought forward um, when a ethnic cleansing campaign launched by the Sudanese government was started in Darfur um, in the 2000s and then after the Arab Spring um, when Syria began uh, butchering its population. Um, that there was a concerted effort to try to document those atrocities, to broadcast them out to the world, to magnify them so that people were aware of them. And in both of those cases, there was there was largely no policy response to to stop atrocities. Um, and so I think it's maybe worth stepping back and asking how much evidence there really is for the CNN effect and how would this actually work? Um, when social scientists have dug into this, they found really quite weak evidence um, for the CNN effect. Um, and it, this, this weak evidence sort of comes in a couple of different places. One is that even that initial example of Somalia appears to be maybe not entirely correct, that the reason why George Bush was seeing images of starving children in Somalia wasn't because starving children in Somalia make for good news. Um, there was essentially no coverage of Somalia or starving children or the atrocities and, and horrors that were happening under warlords. That just wasn't on the radar of CNN or any cable news until um, members of the Congressional Black Caucus went to Somalia and brought reporters along with them saying, there is a problem here. You need to pay attention. And so it wasn't actually the media that was driving this so much as it was um, politicians in the United States saying, this needs to be a priority and we're gonna mobilize media to put pressure on other politicians to, to take action. Um, and so that's maybe a slightly different story um, than the images themselves are, are driving um, policymakers. Um, it also appears, um, well, it, it also appears that there's a breakdown in this whole process and in the way that this works. And so um, with the rise of cell phones and, and um, you know, ubiquitous recording equipment, um, atrocities have become widespread and available. Um, in terms of international atrocities, I think there's very little evidence that when people see horrific things happening, genocide or um, other atrocities, that their reaction is to take to the streets, to write their congressmen or women, to you know, write letters to the editor, to mobilize, to push, to do the things that would prompt politicians to take action. That that step doesn't seem to happen. Instead, there seems to be maybe a shutting down effect, um, a sort of disassociation effect, um, a sense of helplessness that sometimes comes with that. And so I, I don't know that this idea that being sort of broadcast horrible images mobilizes political action really bears much, much weight, particularly in the international arena. Um, if I was going to make a case for um, the CNN effect having some, some value and being important, I might um, sort of flip things around. Um, that it's not just the images of atrocities happening elsewhere that prompt um, humanitarian intervention and, and states going out into the world. Um, there's also sort of the body bag effect that as the horrors of war and intervention are witnessed by the population, they call for an end to that, that they sort of call for, um, for a more restrained foreign policy because they're seeing the consequences of that, of that war. Um, and then if I was going to make another argument, it would be that it's really hard to pin this down. Um, to know exactly how media is affecting um, foreign policy and how all this works, because the media environment over the last 30 years has transformed so much that it's really hard to be able to know and to track over time how much impact a story in the New York Times versus a story um, on CNN versus a story on Fox News versus a story on um, 
vice.com is going to have on sort of broader public opinion. Um, and so I think that pinning down the exact effect is actually really hard. Um, and the fact that we're really working with just anecdotes at this point um, is maybe all we really can do to try to understand what's a very complex and messy relationship. 